Welcome everyone to the programme. I'm Melissa Walker in Lagos. We begin with news of the attacks in Kyiv, Ukraine's capital. Um, video shared on social media by Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky showing the aftermath of a Russian missile strike on the centre of Kyiv this morning. Burning vehicles, damaged buildings and street furniture were visible with emergency crews working on the scene. In a post accompanying the video, President Zelensky accused Russia of trying to destroy uh, Ukrainians and wipe them off the face of the earth. He said they were dead and wounded as a result of the attacks. Russia struck cities across Ukraine during rush hour this morning, killing civilians, destroying infrastructure in apparent revenge after uh, President Putin declared an explosion on the bridge to Crimea to be a terrorist attack. Kiev city police said at least five people had been killed, 12 wounded in the capital. Uh, cruise missiles tore into busy intersections, parks and tourist sites in the center of downtown Kyiv with an intensity on scene even when Russian forces attempted to capture the capital early in the war. Explosions were also reported in Lviv, Ternopil and Zotima in Ukraine's west, Dnipro and Kremenchuk in central Ukraine, Zaporizhia in the south and Kharkiv in the east. And viewers correspondent Anna Chenikova joins us now. Ever since Anna has been joining us, she has been joining us from the capital, Kyiv, and she's with us now. Hi, Anna. It's so good to see you. I mean, hearing about this, uh, the attacks uh, on the city. Uh, tell us, you know, when this happened and, and what is going on now. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, well, I'm standing right at the place where uh, one of the attacks happened today early in the morning. Uh, the first explosion uh, was heard in Kiev at around 8.20 local time uh, in the morning. So uh, here uh, you can see, uh, well, yeah, you can see that the repair works are, are already ongoing. A rescue operation was, uh, was completed by by the afternoon as soon as uh, every tyrant was off. Uh, for the moment, we know that except of Kyiv, the attack was happening in 14 other regions as well. Uh, so basically west, south, north and, um, uh, and east parts of the country were under attack. Uh, for the moment here in Kyiv, uh, well, actually the city is almost uh, completely cleaned up. Of course, a lot of infrastructure is damaged and uh, still there are huge damages uh, of the roads and uh, in the park in particular. Uh, as I'm standing here, it's uh, a place where two explosions happen. So uh, it's uh, uh, a street next to the, one of the main universities uh, of Ukraine and a huge park just in the capital squad uh, in this very city center. Uh, we know that according to the general staff, official, official data, uh, at least 84 missiles were fired. Uh, 43 of them uh, were um, Ukrainian air defense uh, managed to destroy. Uh, also, there were at least 24, if I'm not mistaken, drones used. Uh, but drones were mostly used in the south and uh, also some uh, other parts of the country, like north, but not in Kiev. Uh, so for the moment, uh, I should say that uh, this attack was different from the one that happened in Ukraine, in Kyiv in particular, in particularly on the first day of full-scale invasion. Uh, uh, the difference is that, uh, you know, on the 24th of February, people were really very scared and it was panic. Today, I cannot see panic. People were very reasonable. People knew what to do, how to uh, act, where to hide. So uh, I cannot say that there is panic in, in, the, con in the country in general and in Kyiv in particular. Uh, of course, people are trying to get uh, some more water because uh, there is information that it might be some uh, some um, uh, troubles with supplies. But uh, for the moment, situation is abs absolutely fine and stable. Uh, we know that also uh, there is some there are some problems with electricity and water supply in different parts of the country. Uh, the city of Lviv, 90% of the city uh, is actually uh, with no electricity for the moment and with uh, water supply problems. Uh, Kyiv is much better, but still government asks Ukrainians uh, and Kyiv citizens in particular, local uh, authorities ask not to use 
uh, to uh, like to reduce the consumption of electricity just in case just to make sure that uh, it will be enough so it might be some um, shortage of electricity but for the moment uh, for the moment it's fine again some areas uh, had some shortages but now electricity is back and the other way around so for the moment uh, this is like that in terms of the casualties uh, for the moment, we have information about more than 10 people killed and uh, more than 60 injured and wounded. Uh, some of those, dozens actually of those, are in the hospital. But uh, still, uh, these numbers could change, and of course, we will be waiting for updates. Uh, but, well, this is, this is what we have. Of course, this, um, uh, I think that you can see now, uh, so this, um, this reconstruction would take place for a couple of days now because actually the damages are quite heavy and thus if you look around uh, a lot of the buildings are with no windows so um, it's definitely the wave was uh, was really huge uh, i myself i was at home at the point of the explosion and also our apartment building was shaking and windows were shaking so most of the day today uh, we all spent at the bomb shelters uh, either at the underground parking, so, so people use a lot of this as a, as, as a shelter, or uh, in the metro station. And Anna, we've been seeing, you know, a lot of people moving uh, around you. I mean, I was going to ask, hoping that, you know, it is safe to be where you are, um, but then we're seeing a lot of people outside as well. Um, what is the Ukrainian government? How have they responded to this? And, and what is the, the plans moving forward? Uh, this is, of course, hoping that there aren't any more strikes. But then if that should happen, what then happens next? Ukrainian government... Uh of course, told people to be very careful, especially when the raid, uh, air raid siren is on. So what you can see now behind me that a lot of people are actually out to the street when the second air raid siren of the day was off, because uh, during, uh, during the morning, it was five, more than five hours of, of the alarm. Uh, and after that, it was another air raid siren for more than one hour. So everyone were inside or in the shelters. Now people, yes, actually a lot of people are around. They come to see the scene of the tragedy and uh, just to see what's happening uh, around. Uh, Ukrainian government and President Zelensky in particular said that, of course, this is an act of terror from Russia and uh, G7 meeting would be, uh, would, be arranged, um, would be arranged because of that. Uh, Ukrainian government also said to, to Ukrainians to be specifically careful uh, for this next couple of days because attacks could repeat and uh, uh, of course there is a big risk and big scare of, of, uh, of, repeat, uh, of the rep repetition of these attacks. Uh, President Zelensky definitely would have his uh, everyday uh, daily speech in the evening and he might give some more details but definitely Ukrainian reaction would be tough and uh, it, it, it feels like that uh, Ukrainian reaction would be tough on the front line and on the battlefield in particular. Good, Anna, thank you so much. Do continue to stay safe, please. Uh, we'll talk to you some other time when we can. Thanks so much for that update. Thank you. And VOA Anna Chenikova sent us in those pictures, videos that you are seeing of reconstruction already taking place, power lines. Uh, she had mentioned earlier about electricity cuts after some of the missiles struck uh, a university building and several other buildings that were shattered earlier today. She had mentioned casualty figures, which we are hearing. Uh, five people uh, confirmed killed, 12 wounded in the Russian missile strikes in the capital, Kyiv. A police statement on Facebook had said most hits were in the center of the capital. Several explosions rocking uh, the cities of Lviv, uh, Ternopil, Dnipro. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Russia has accused Ukraine of orchestrating a powerful blast that damaged a key bridge linking Russia and Crimea. 
eyewitness saw a huge carter of one of the city centre's intersections and uh, nearby cars completely wrecked, blackened uh, and pitted with uh, shrapnel. Russia abandoned an early advance on Kyiv in the face of fierce resistance bouldered uh, by Western arms. It's all of the reconstruction uh, taking place, but of course they are trying to take uh, a bit of those bombs out of those locations uh, so that it is safe for, for everyone who is still moving around there in the capital, Kyiv. Well, still following the strikes, a large plume of smoke dominated Lviv's skyline. Now, that appeared uh, to have narrowly missed uh, electrical planes serving the city. Explosions were also reported in several other Ukrainian cities, uh, including the capital, after they were targeted by Russian cruise missiles. Zelensky's prime minister said that 11 major infrastructure targets were hit in eight regions, uh, leaving Swan parts of con the country with no power, water or heat. By mid-morning, Ukraine's defense ministry said Russia had fired 81 cruise missiles and Ukraine's air defenses has shot down 43 of them. Well, let's hear from President Vladimir Zelensky, who said Russia timed its strikes on Ukraine to inflict the greatest possible losses among people and had also targeted the country's energy infrastructure. Ukrainian women, the morning is difficult. We're dealing with terrorists, dozens of missiles, Iranian Shahid. They have two targets, the energy facilities throughout the country, Kiev region, Lviv and Dnipro. Venezia, Frankiv region, Zaporizhia, Sumy region, Kharkiv region, the south of the country. They want panic and chaos. They want to destroy our energy system. They are hopeless. The second target is people. Such a time, such goals were specially chosen to cause as much damage as possible. But we are Ukrainians. We help each other. We believe in ourselves. We restore everything that is destroyed. There may be temporary power outages now, but there will never be an interruption in our confidence, our confidence in victory. Why exactly such strikes? The enemy wants us to be afraid, to make people run. But we can only run forward, and we demonstrate this on the battlefield. It will continue to be so. Rescuers are working now. Our air defense system is at work. Already 38 aerial targets have been shut down. Please stay in shelters today. Thanks to the help of our military, everything will be fine. Always follow the safety rules. And always remember, Ukraine existed before this enemy appeared, and Ukraine will exist after it. Glory to Ukraine. You just heard from Ukrainian president on the latest uh, missile strikes from Russia. But his counterparts in Russia, Vladimir Putin, said Ukraine had carried out terrorist acts against Russia and pledged to react forcefully if they continued. In televised remarks, Mr. Putin said Moscow had launched long-range missile attacks against Ukraine's energy, military and communications infrastructure in retaliation for an attack on a vital bridge linking Russia Russia to the annexed Crimean Peninsula over the weekend. Ukrainian officials were exultant after the blast. Uh, cities across Ukraine were left without power or water and, of course, heat. More than a dozen Ukrainian cities uh, strikes hit uh, earlier this morning. Putin said Russia would respond harshly to any further attacks by Ukraine. Forensic and other expert data, as well as intelligence information, have shown that the explosion on October 8 was an act of terrorism, an act aimed at destroying Russia's critically important civil infrastructure. It is also obvious that it was the Ukrainian secret services who ordered, organized, and carried out this act of terrorism. But a whole host of other terror attacks and attempted attacks have been also carried out against the electricity and gas transporting infrastructure of our country, including an attempt to blow parts of the Turkish stream gas transporting system. All of this was proved by unbiased findings, including testimony from the detained perpetrator of those terror attacks. It is simply impossible to leave crimes of this kind unanswered. This morning, in line with suggestions given by the Defense Ministry and in accordance with the Russian General Staff's plan, a mass strike 
was launched with long-range, high-precise air, sea, and land-based weapons against Ukraine's energy facilities, military command, and communication facility. If attempts to carry out acts of terrorism on our territory continue, Russia's response will be harsh, and its scale will correspond to that of the threat made against the Russian Federation. No one should be in any doubt about that. Let's hear from an eyewitness now, Malet Seva. She talked about missile strikes hitting a house and university building in Mykolaiv as Russia shelled cities across Ukraine. Well, she lives nearby and came to see the scene as a fence of her friends uh, was hit. According to press officer of Mykolaiv Regional Military Administration, Dmitry Plentinchuk, it was at night that it happened. Mykolaiv once again was under missile strike by the Russian occupied. Plentichuk added that both Russian areas and various institutions, municipal, state and private property, were shelled. Russian fired cruise missiles at the city, killing at least 10 civilians, knocking out power and heat. And what we've heard President Putin declare revenge for Ukrainian attacks. Mayor of Kyiv, Vasily Klitschko, rebuked the Russian missile attacks on his city and elsewhere in Ukraine. He described the attacks in which five people died in the capital and another 41 left critically ill as a war against civilians, adding that Putin needs Ukraine without Ukrainians. He said the number of times the city had been targeted made it clear that Kyiv was still a main target for the Russians. But instead of being depressed, the people were angry about the senseless war that won bring back the Soviet Union. We have a massive uh, racket attack to our hometown, capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. I tell that uh, and I want to repeat, Kyiv was and still the target, uh, main target of Russian uh, Russians. I hope not, but uh, we have to be prepared to, for more attacks today. Uh, before today, the Russians killed uh, already two, uh, 226 uh, civilians and four children. Today killed five people more. Right now, uh, 41 people in hospitals and uh, some people in critical condition. And that's why the numbers of uh, dead people can be much higher. It's the war against civilians. Putin needs Ukraine without Ukrainians. And uh, Putin attacked Kiev uh, a couple of weeks ago, months ago, a couple of months ago, and uh, Kiev was target and still target of Russians. took shelter in a Kyiv metro and comforted each other by signing traditional folk singing, rather traditional folk songs, as Russia's missile barrage shattered four months calm in the Ukrainian capital. As Russian cruise missiles rained down the city, the residents in Kyiv took shelter in the metro station. They began singing, Oh, in the Cherry Garden, a traditional folk song. Thousands of residents raced to bomb shelters as air raid sirens rang out through the day. The barrage of dozens of missiles fired from air, land and sea was the biggest wave of airstrikes to hit locations away from the front line, at least since the initial volleys on the war's first day to 24th of February.
European Commission condemned as heinous attacks Russian missile strikes in Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities today that killed civilians and damaged civilian infrastructure. Peter Stano, a spokesperson for the European Union's executive arm at a regular news briefing, called the attacks barbaric and cowardly. It described the strikes as a contravention of international humanitarian law and said it amounted to a war crime. Stano said Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's assertion that Ukraine was planning an attack against this country was totally unfounded, ridiculous accusations, he said. The spokesperson called on Minsk not to provide support to Moscow in its attacks against Ukraine. Indeed, the European Union uh, condemns in the strongest possible terms these heinous attacks on the civilians and civilian infrastructure. These attacks, they are barbaric and cowardly attacks, and they only show that Russia is uh, opting for a tactic uh, with aiming and indiscriminately bombing the civilians. This is something which is inter against international humanitarian law, and this indiscriminate targeting of civilians amounts to a war crime. Indeed, we took note of the, of the false accusations uh, from Lukashenko regime against Ukraine that uh, Ukraine is allegedly planning an attack on the territory of Belarus. These are totally unfounded, ridiculous accusations. They are utterly uh, unacceptable. Ukraine here is the victim, Ukraine is not the ag aggressor. And we remind the Belarusian regime that uh, Ukraine is under brutal illegal attack which is in violation of the UN Charter and in violation of the international law. And we urge the regime in Minsk to refrain from any involvement um, of Belarus in this brutal illegitimate undertaking. And we also urge the regime in Minsk to immediately stop allowing the territory of Belarus to serve as a launch pad for airstrikes, including the very recent missile strikes and drone attacks against Ukraine. For China's foreign ministry, Beijing hopes for a de-escalation in Ukraine after explosions rocked several cities in Kyiv. Now, they've also said the ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said, we hope the situation will de-escalate soon. Last week, China's ambassador to the United Nations, Zhang Jun, told a Security Council meeting that isolation and sanctions would only lead to a dead end after the United States called for the body to condemn Russia's referendums in the occupied regions of Ukraine. And India does not want to say in advance how it will vote at the United Nations General Assembly on a likely draft resolution condemning Russia's proclaimed annexation of parts of Ukraine. Its foreign minister, Zebra Maniam Jaishanka, told a joint media briefing along with Australia's foreign minister, Penny Wong, in Canberra. The General Assembly is due to vote on the draft resolution on Tuesday. Uh, that's tomorrow or the day after. Diplomats said Russia has vetoed a UN Security Council resolution resolution introduced by the United States and Albania uh, late last month condemning the proclaimed annexation with China, Gabon, India and Brazil abstaining. Prudence and uh, policy, we don't predict our votes in advance. Uh, having said that, uh, you also know that uh, we have been very clearly uh, uh, against the conflict in Ukraine. We believe that this conflict does not serve the interests of anybody, uh, uh, neither the participants nor indeed of the international community. Uh, and uh, as a country of the global south, uh, we have been uh, seeing firsthand uh, how much it has impacted low-income countries, uh, the challenges that they are facing in terms of fuel and food and fertilizers. You know, my Prime Minister uh, said a few weeks ago at Samarkand that uh, this is not an era of war. And, uh, 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 you know, a conflict today in some corner of the world can have a very profound impact on, on everybody across the world. And I think that continues to guide our thinking. Now, 
to other stories, North Korea's recent flurry of missile tests were designed to simulate showering the South with tactical nuclear weapons as a warning after large-scale Navy drills by South Korean and U.S. forces. North Korea fired two ballistic missiles early on Sunday, officials in Seoul and Tokyo said, making it the seventh such launch since September 25. Leader Kim Jong-un guided exercises by nuclear tactical operation units over the past two weeks involving ballistic missiles with mock nuclear warheads uh, was reported by the local media there saying it was to deliver a strong message of war deterrence. The various tests simulated targeting military command facilities, striking main ports and neutralizing airports in the south. Uh, the station said North Korea's ruling workers party decided to conduct the drills as an, an unavoidable response to a large-scale mobilization of U.S. and South Korean naval forces, including an aircraft carrier and a nuclear-powered submarine. Meanwhile, North Koreans have offered flowers and paid tribute today to bronze statues of the country's former leaders to mark 77 years since the ruling Workers' Party of Korea was founded. In footage provided by state news agency KCNA, North Koreans were seen offering flowers and bowing to the statues of founder Kim Il-sung, late leader Kim Jong-il, at Mansur Day Grand Monument. Uh, earlier on Monday, KCNA said North Koreans' recent flow of tests were designed to shower the South with tactical nuclear weapons as a warning. Away from North Korea, war between Taiwan and China is absolutely not an option. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen said this as she reiterated her willingness to talk to Beijing and also pledged to boost the island's defenses, including with precision missiles. She said in her National Day speech outside the presidential office under a grey sky that it was regrettable that China had escalated its intimidation and threatened peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and region. China China should not think there is room for compromise and the commitment of Taiwan's people to democracy and freedom. Her speech comes less than a week before China's ruling Communist Party's Congress opens in Beijing, where President Xi Jinping is widely expected to win a precedent-breaking third five-year term. Democratic Taiwan, which China claims as its territory, has come under increasing military and political pressure from Beijing, especially after Chinese war games in early August following a Taipei visit by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Well, let's talk some more about this. Foreign Affairs commentator Adam Roosevelt joins me now on the program. He joins me from Dubai. Uh, thanks, Adam, for joining me on the program. Let's begin with North Korea breaking its silence uh, over the country's recent spate of missile tests. I mean, it's been six months since we heard anything. Um, were you surprised? Well, first, let me start by saying thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. I am not particularly surprised. I do believe that many nations who have been trying to increase their nuclear capabilities see this as a time, especially because we're at the Russia-Ukraine conversation, which really is making some countries bold in their decisions. So I, I am not particularly surprised. I think that North Korea has been aggressive for a long period of time, and now they have a moment where they can flex their muscles given the justification that the United States is carrying out joint military exercises, which they would say is an endangerment to their national security. But what do you think, you know, its announcements today indicates? Do you think it's made potential progress in its missile program? Well, I will say that, you know, the intelligence community, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency have been working covertly to ensure that these programs do not continue forward. 
Obviously, economics is a very big contributor to the ability for a nation to advance its weapons in terms of nuclear capabilities. We've sanctioned North Korea, but if a nation is focused on uh, attaining this level of capability, I do think that North Korea can increase its ability to reach that objective, but I do not think that they have, in fact, uh, been able to accomplish that objective today. In terms of the international community, which you've talked about, um, many wonder, I mean, how do they see this and, you know, how have they been reacting to this and do you think that their reactions have been adequate? Well, I think the NATO powers in the European Union, they will be one group of nations that will uh, be a coalition to respond against nations that we do not believe should have nuclear capabilities, such as uh, Iran, uh, such as North Korea. So sanctions will be a, a part of the first phase, and then we would be looking at other things that we can do to limit their ability to reach these objectives. But I think that a North Korea nuclear state would not be a benefit to the West, and I would argue that it would not be a benefit to the globe. So Washington will do all it can to contain North Korea's ability to become a nuclear power and an aggressor, which would challenge Washington's interest. And the U.S., South Korea, and of course uh, Japan have, you know, had active, perhaps still having active military exercise. Um, do you think? you know, if something bad were to happen, that they could uh, stop it? Well, you know, the importance of having military assets deployed, whether they are Army assets or Navy assets, it's the ability to deploy countermeasures. And what the United States and NATO partners do, do is they sell those weapons to those partners, such as South Korea, to be prepared to counter short-range tactical nuclear uh, assets as well as long-range international ballistic missiles. So I think every country is trying to posture themselves in a higher defense position. But in terms of the advanced ability uh, to acquire those capabilities, it does come with economic and it does come with trust because some of these weapon systems are classified and they do not allow certain parties to acquire those weapon systems. But of course, if you were to think of uh, North Korea's defense, it appears to be saying that the latest drill um, between the U.S. and South Korea is, you know, what is fueling its actions uh, at this time. Uh, would you say perhaps that things have gene degenerated um, such that uh, this is escalating and possibly into a real war in the future? Well, I think what we're seeing is coalitions begin to expand uh, we've got coalitions in the East that are rapidly expanding with the UAE, the GCC, and Russia from an economic perspective. We just saw OPEC Plus make a decision to decrease oil output. These are all of the different factors that are playing, uh, I would say, contributing to what we see as a coalition expanding its power. Uh, whether we agree or not agree, these things are having causes and effects based on decisions that Washington is making. Furthermore, the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, just went down uh, to this location, and that could be seen as an act of provocation. So with the Taiwan-China issue and how China sees ta Taiwan in terms of its territory in the U.S. encroaching, with the exercises in the Korean Peninsula, how North Korea sees South Korea in the U.S. relation. So all of this uh, geopolitically is contributing to each individual nation looking at the West and saying they're encroaching on our territory and they're carrying out military exercises that compromise our position from a national security perspective. And that compromise is what we heard um, earlier from Taiwan's president saying uh, that a war between Taiwan and China is absolutely not an option. What do you think the politics stands, seeing as um, President Xi Jinping will be making uh, a huge decision in a couple of days? Well, I think that the most important thing is that the election in China goes forward with President Xi Jinping winning the election. So he needs to have a strong anti-Western position. So the trip with Nancy Pelosi put him in a position. The Chinese 
Communist Party wants to know, can President Xi Jinping lead? Can he push back against the West and is he willing? But how far is he willing to push back? We saw Russia as a natural aggressor pushing against the West. The question now becomes, President Xi, how far will you go to also push back against the West now that they're encroaching in territory like Taiwan and they're causing problems from the perspective of national security. We want to see you lead. We also want to see you take an aggressive stance. And he will have to answer that question, how he will deliver uh, in terms of response to this. Adam, we'd like to thank you. Adam Roosevelt is a foreign affairs commentator. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Let's go over to the U.S. now, where former U.S. President Donald Trump campaigned in Arizona yesterday for Republican candidates ahead of the midterm elections. During his speech, Mr. Trump said the world is on the verge of World War III and blamed alleged inaction by the Biden administration. Take a listen. There's only one way to end this nightmare, this madness. If you want the decline and fall of America, then you must vote radical left Democrat. If you want to see this country continue, there's never been a time where our country was so embarrassed. It's just a disgrace what's happened. Do you want to see that go? Vote Democrat. They don't know what the hell they're doing, except when it comes to cheating on elections. They're very good at that. If you want to stop the destruction of our country and save the American dream, our good old American dream, and we were talking about it a lot just two years ago, then you have to vote Republican up and down the line. And now we have a war between Russia and Ukraine with potentially hundreds of thousands of people dying. We must demand immediate negotiation of a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine. Well, we will end up in World War III, and there will never be a war like this. We will never have had a war like this, and that's all because of stupid people that don't have a clue. And it's also because of the kind of weaponry that's available today. You, we never had weapons like this, the destructive capability of weapons, modern weapons. I know more about it than anybody because of the fact that I rebuilt our military. Over in Britain, climate activists blocked the mall near Buckingham Palace in London, causing delays and disruption for the 10th day running. The demonstrators were from Just Stop Oil, which describes itself as a coalition of groups working together to bring an end to the exploration, development and production of fossil fuels. A tweet from Just Stop Oil's uh, Twitter account said some of the protesters had glued themselves to the road. Malaysian Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob called for an early election today, hoping to win a stronger mandate for his party and stabilize the rocky political landscape that has plagued the country over the last four years. In a televised speech, Ismail said the country's monarch had agreed to his request to dissolve parliament today and an election date would be announced by the Election Commission. Polls must be held within 60 days of the dissolution of Parliament. Voter turnouts could be reduced if the chosen date falls during the year-end monsoon season. Ismail said he was calling for the election to end questions over the legitimacy of his government and return the mandate to the people. The ruling party's rush for an election comes as the economy, still recovering from COVID, has begun to feel the pinch of rising costs and a global slowdown. An election was not not due until September 2023, but Ismail has been under increasing pressure from some factions of his ruling coalition to hold the vote earlier due to infighting. And a Spanish Coast Guard vessel transported 23 migrants found in the Atlantic Ocean to the port of Oguenguin. This is in the island of Gran Canaria today. The Red Cross uh, said that the migrants, all African men, were rescued as they traveled in a dinghy 40 miles south of the island. The Coast Guard said that every year thousands of people leave North Africa to make the perilous journey to Europe. A total of 22,000 migrants crossed 
by uh, boat to the Canary Islands in 2021 after 23,271 made the crossings in 2020. Last year, some 4,400 people were lost at sea attempting to reach Spain. Uh, last week, 33 people making the journey from Africa to Europe died in the dengue after traveling for nine days. Spain's Coast Guard managed to find four of the bodies which were taken to Gran Canaria. And Tropical Storm Julia emerged over the eastern Pacific on Sunday evening after plummeting Nicaragua with rain and winds that damaged hundreds of homes but left no reported casualties. The storm made landfall in the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua early on Sunday near Laguna Parelas and by 6 p.m. local time its center was over the Pacific around 135 miles southeast of El Salvador's capital. It is expected to move north along the coasts of Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala. Uh, Julia blew off roofs and down trees and lamp lights which landed on top of some houses causing severe damage on the coastal town of Bluefields. The Bluefields residents Ana Gonzalez told local reporters that several trees had fallen on top of two mechanical workshops owned by her family. About one million residents of Nicaragua's coastal region lost power and internet due to fallen lines as well as the decision by the government to cut electricity for safety reasons. The Nicaragua National Disaster System said in a tweet on Sunday that the entire country was under red alert after heavy rains caused multiple rivers to flood. Heavy rains and overflowing rivers caused floods in various states across Guatemala Saturday and Sunday. The Guatemalan Red Cross says the rain was associated to the tropical storm Julia, expected to reach the Central American country. In Santo Tomas de Castille, located in the northeastern state of Isabel, Red Cross helped evacuate families from flooded neighborhoods into safer areas. In the Zacapa department, local authorities reported they were monitoring the Santiago River after it started to overflow. Flow. Uh, Tropical Storm Julia was downgraded from the hurricane as it crossed the Central American country of Nicaragua after slamming into its Caribbean coast. staying with the floods at least 22 people died 52 went missing after five small rivers in central venezuela flooded due to heavy rains the downpour on saturday night swept large trunk trees and debris from surrounding mountains into the community of tigerias 40 miles southwest of caracas damaging businesses and farmland the vice president said the priority was to locate people still trapped under mud and rocks throughout the town while military and rescue personnel also searched the riverbanks for survivors. El Pato, one of the flooded rivers, swept away several houses, shops and a slaughterhouse. Terry Gia's resident, Luis Naranjo, uh, said his niece went missing, not knowing if she was buried under the landslide or if she was dragged by the river. Carlos Perez, deputy minister for the country's civil protection system, said in a tweet that 1,000 officers were looking for victims in, this, in the area. An Egyptian water treatment company has devised a mobile water desalination unit that uses solar energy to treat underground water from salinity and minerals to be used for drinking and irrigation. This device offers solution to farmers in the country. Due to fresh water scarcity, farmers depend heavily on underground water which has high levels of salinity and could kill the crops. The newly designed water desalination model decreases the salinity from over 1,000 parts per million to under 200 parts per million, making it usable for drinking as well as irrigation.
I have 50 feathers of mango crops, of which 30% died due to salinity of water. The well which we used to irrigate the crops had a salinity of 1,700 ppm. Regarding the defect from water salinity, there are none, and the evidence is clear. The desalination units can be put in containers, making it a mobile system to reach different areas. It can also be attached to a solar power grid, sufficient to run the unit, as well as other services. The unit has a production capacity of 600 cubic meters per day. We have managed to provide pure drinkable water in remote areas which suffered severe water scarcity and people there were suffering from the lack of drinkable water. This is in terms of drinkable water. In the farming sector, we were able to treat the water in over 35 farms to be used to solve the problems in agriculture. Water scarcity and salinity are some of the climate challenges for Egypt, a country with a rapidly growing population that's already heavily dependent on food imports. We're back here in Nigeria in continuation of our series of reports on crude oil theft in the country. The Aframo, a platform in an offshore oil installation belonging to Shell Petroleum Development Company, has allegedly been identified as one of the stolen crude division facility used by vandals. Our senior correspondent, Olu Phillips, brings us more in this next report. Whether through the legitimate oil sale by the federal government and now the outrageous and audacious stealing and refining, Nigeria's sweet crude is having a sore commentary in recent times. Stories now abound in public domain following our reports on the extent of theft and consequences seen in the sharp drop of production numbers for one of OPEC's significant members. Earlier, Channel's television brought you exclusive pictures the first by any media station in Nigeria of one of the suspected tilling points. That offshore platform is known as the Apremo A platform offshore Escrabos and is owned by Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria. So this oil platform has three main pipelines traveling from here all the way to Escrabos and it is buried over the sea and through this swamp. This is what happens, there are three lines here. This is the test line and that's the line we have decided to use. So it tells you that this is very active. If you look at this, this line, you see that it's not active. Everything around here is dried. The same with that other one. You can see the screws, the knots are all dried up. But if you see this place, it, it raises suspicion. Now, whenever they're ready to um, siphon oil, they remove this, tighten it all back. It tells you, look at this, it tells you that this is active. This is very active. I mean, it's not well screwed and all of that. So it tells you they do this regularly. They open this valve. Um, of course, this travels all the way into onshore. So it goes all the way whenever they are ready. You can see that there's nothing connected to this exit point. Uh, it's a test line. It is not supposed to be an active line. But look at this. This tells you there's been a fresh uh, onslaught. There's been fresh... Uh, discharge from this point. This is crude, not engine oil, not any other thing. This is crude. So they connect a hose to this place and run it to a vessel, a flatbed vessel, not the very big ones, a flat bezel, uh, flat, uh, bed vessel that can take uh, between like uh, four or five tons to about six tons because of the draft of this side of the water. And so how do you know that this is an active platform? Because if it wasn't, um, look at this place. Look at this. Look at this the same point. This is active crude. If this wasn't active, then this crude shouldn't be here. Look at it. This is crude oil. It should be sealed up like this or sealed up like this, covered. But see, so where is the cover of this pipe is the question. We asked Shell's representative what they knew of this connection or why despite their claimed surveillance apparatus didn't capture this. We did not know of this until when our guys discovered it, when the big grab When was that? That was on the 5th of uh, this month of October. 
Just one month ago. One week. Just one week ago. Interesting. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the next one. Interesting. Interesting. One week ago. Given the number of years this might have gone on, the quantity stolen will fall in the region of millions. It was a daring undertaking to follow the crude line to this 2.5 miles location using boats, but an effort worth the risk. No one expects the scale of investigation to be meager. What will be interesting and deterring will be the sheer number of persons who may be involved in these years of suspected racket and how they will be prosecuted, especially how retribution will be made to the country Nigeria. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Well, you can watch more on our investigative report with Olu Phillips there. You can find that on our YouTube channel, forward slash channels web, and our website, channelstv.com. That's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antonio. Bye for now.